just a neat idea where the council would uh, give a clear concept and then the uh, mission implements it. I think that is, that is a nice dream, but I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, <laughs> because of that, it's very important that the countries that care about the situation are part of the implementation of uh, what they care about. Uh, and I think it's very, and so I think it's very important to broaden the burden of uh, peacekeeping. Something we discussed already in the in the previous session. I think it's important for reasons of solidarity, because I think there's no question that a capable peacekeeping is a riskier peacekeeping. You know, if you patrol at night, you run a greater risk of getting shot than if you patrol in broad daylight. If you if you establish a mobile operating base in the middle of nowhere. It's, uh, you may get attacked, uh, there's a greater risk of attack that you have a well set up uh, base. Uh, so, proactive peacekeeping is more dangerous than very conservative peacekeeping. Now, are the countries that do that proactive peacekeeping and do it sometimes unsatisfactory, are they prepared to do it indefinitely and to do it more and more proactively if the burden is not shared? I don't think so. So I think there is a problem of sustainability and it's a serious problem when you see how the concentration of uh, peacekeeping comes from, uh, of peacekeepers comes from uh, South Asia. Uh, so there's an issue of solidarity. There's an issue of effectiveness for everything I said about intelligence, mobility, training, uh, training of the troops, training of the officers. You need capable troops because what this peacekeeping in the gray area that we're now confronting is a very difficult uh, peacekeeping. So you need a level of qualification and training that is much greater than uh, peacekeeping as we used to, to, to know it. And last, not least, for reasons of control. Too. I think if you want, I mean the, and that applies to the members of the Security Council, especially the, the permanent members, uh, if you if you're not in a position really to, to define the mission in clear terms, you will want to see what's happening by being there. And so if, you, if you're going in the direction of having missions with a greater degree of flexibility in the way they develop their own concept of, uh, of operation and in the way they implement the concept of operation, if you, if you go in that direction, I think you will have to participate in that implementation. So I will conclude by saying that in, in my view, I mean, peacekeeping, capable peacekeeping, uh, peacekeeping that makes a robust use of force when necessary, is not sustainable with the present uh, ar arrangement of burden sharing, where there's one set of countries that decides, one that pays, and one that, one that implements. I don't think it can work indefinitely. I think we're going to have a real problem if we continue that way. And I think the, the big question is the one I, meant, I rose in the previous session. I think the big question is, does peacekeeping, uh, is peacekeeping seen as a strategic, of strategic importance or not? I mean, that means, are fragile states a strategic issue or not? Uh, the UN cannot really live um, and be a strong organization if it is seen just as an organization for second tier issues that don't re matter really that much. Uh, it has to be seen as an organization that matters because it deals with issues that matter. And if it deals with issues that matter, then the countries that have the capabilities will get engaged. They have to be convinced that the issue that the UN deals with in fragile states are issues that matter. Alors, euh, merci, euh, Monsieur Guénou, merci, euh, Bill Deutsch. Je pense que là, nous avons euh, une richesse euh, d'analyse et euh, d'interrogation <coughs> sur euh, le maintien de la paix robuste, euh, qui nous sera impossible euh, d'épuiser dans les dix prochaines minutes, mais bien sûr, euh, nous prendrons un peu plus de temps que les dix minutes qui nous sont imparties pour accueillir des questions. Donc, euh, j'ouvre le débat. Euh, pour la salle, je vous demanderai bien sûr de vous identifier. 
Donc, euh, voilà ici. Microphone. My first question. My first question is: uh, I was a bit uh, surprised to see that neither of you uh, raised the issue of neutrality, uh, which was quite uh, well explained in the Brayini report. And I thought that that was a novel thing about the Brayini report: is that he set or set the pace by explaining exactly what was neutrality and eventually opening it to using force when neutrality was not respected by either parties. The, the comments, and I'll try to restrain my comments very briefly, is what Mr. Guillemot uh, uh, has uh, described to us is not peacekeeping, it's peace enforcement. So uh, I'm a bit surprised that the UN is trying to, is trying to revive uh, peacekeeping by adding up those uh, new cal uh, qual qualification it's not peacekeeping, it's peace enforcement. And that's exactly what the Canadians are doing right now in, uh, in Kandahar. Peace enforcement, and then you try to stabilize the situation. And somewhere within that stabilization phase, that's where peacekeeping is eventually is getting involved. So the real question should not be, how should we dress up peacekeeping so it, was, it more or less answered to the needs of the time, but when should we, in fact, Transform a mission to peacekeeping operation. Thank you. Can we take uh, several yeah. questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Chergi. Yes, uh, Nejla Chergi. Uh, I'm uh, a research affiliate at the University of Ottawa currently. Um, very interesting presentations uh, by both. Uh, thank you very much. I wanted to pick up on uh, the issue of robust peacekeeping. Uh, I know Bill's perspective on it, which uh, he articulated in his contribution to Peace Operations 2009, but I wanted both of you to reflect on the impact of expanded mandates on robustness of missions. I mean, the problem, as uh, Jean-Marie mentioned, is uh, the mandates are getting larger and larger and lots of detail and and how has it affected the capacity of peacekeepers to implement those mandates? Would uh, narrower mandates yield more robust peacekeeping? And I'm not talking about peace in enforcement. Uh, Marie Joel. Thank you both for fascinating and extremely rich presentations. Marie-Joël Zahar, I think I don't need to present myself. Um, I'm really interested in your first conclusion, Monsieur Gaino, that is that robust peacekeeping, if it is to mean something, involves more, not less, political choices. And I think I totally agree. But I want to take that to go back to what you said at the very beginning about what has changed in the world of peace operations. You have actually described two major changes. Uh, the fact that we're dealing with non-state actors and the fact that civilians are targets. I think that robust peacekeeping and the need for political choices should get us to rethink the way in which we've cast non-state actors. Um, although I agree that many of them have no political capital, are not interested, for example, in being responsible actors and think of civilians are, as only targets, uh, I would surmise that that is very difficult to apply to all non-state political actors. And unfortunately, the nuance sometimes seems to be lost. And so um, I would like you to reflect on whether or not, especially in this again, post 9-11 world, where some non-state actors are being demonized for political reasons by governments. Um, what you say in terms of political choices does not get us back to the discussion we were having earlier in the first panel about the need to maybe address at the Security Council some extremely difficult issues that the UN has until now failed to really get a consensus on, such as 
who is a terrorist, who needs 